So my last duty this morning uh, in welcoming you is to introduce our keynote speaker. So uh, our keynote today, Selena Larson, started her career as a cybersecurity and privacy journalist, publishing hundreds of articles before making a pivot into cyber threat intelligence. Previously at Dragos, today she is a senior threat intelligence analyst at Proofpoint on their threat research team and a non-resident fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center Cyber Project. She's also been a speaker at a number of conferences, including RSA, S4, SANS CTI, and we're absolutely honored to have her here as our keynote speaker at Attack on 3. Please help me welcome to the stage, Selena Larson. Thank you. Um, is this on? Can you guys all hear me? Great. Because I sound totally normal up here, so I can't tell. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to hang out with me, Adam. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, super appreciate it. Uh, it's really great to see all of you in person. Um, I don't know about most of you, but this is my first IRL conference in a while, and certainly my first uh, speaking conference IRL since 2019. Uh, so it's really amazing to be here with everybody, to see everyone's faces, and all of you joining us virtually as well. Hello. Um, there's a lot of great stuff on deck today, so super stoked we could all be here. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about intelligence failures of Lincoln spies and what cyber threat intelligence analysts can learn from the Civil War. Uh, Adam already did a great introduction for me, so I can kind of go through this a little bit fast. That is my Twitter um, if you wanted to, you know, tweet comments and GIFs and nice things at me. Um, <laughs> and uh, kind of so skipping to kind of the end, uh, since you already know me already, I do have a focus on targeted cybercrime. I want to bring this up because I think for a lot of us that work in cyber threat intelligence, there is a lot of focus on advanced persistent threat state actors, which are definitely... Um, important and uh, very, very valuable, but I have seen kind of a trend among uh, CTI practitioners and, and um, folks that publish threat intelligence uh, publicly that there has been an increase in uh, reports on targeted, targeted cybercrime, really interesting um, uh, cyber criminal activity and an interest in increased interest in tracking those groups. So if you, anyone in the audience is uh, interested in chatting about that or talking about that, um, I'm happy to, uh, to talk to you because it is uh, near and dear to my heart. So what are we going to be talking about this morning? Well, I want to get started to let you know that I was inspired uh, to do this talk because I read a really interesting book by Douglas Waller called Lincoln Spies and Their Secret War to Save a Nation. It's really interesting because it highlights uh, a, a number of actually uh, uh, spies and intelligence officers and people working on, on behalf of the Union for Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, um, specifically four, but one in particular we're going to be kind of talking about today. You will probably recognize his name when I introduce him. But unfortunately, uh, there were a number of uh, reporting failures that really dogged him throughout his relatively short, actually, in comparison to uh, the length of the Civil War, his tenure as a spy master for the Union. We're going to take his learnings and take some of his failures and learn how effective and concise intelligence reporting has the potential to change the course of history. And in the same way, how maybe not great intelligence reporting and uh, disruptions and ineffective communication could have uh, very large impacts as well. And then finally, because this is a MITRE ATT&CK conference, uh, we are going to learn how the MITRE ATT&CK framework can help streamline and effectively communicate actionable threat intelligence. It would be great if you could take away some really key things that you can apply directly in your role, no matter where you are uh, in the organization, um, whether it's uh, learning some tips and tricks for effective intelligence reporting, uh, whether that's uh, garnering and gathering um, intelligence requirements, or possibly just understanding how there have been failures throughout history that we can all learn from, even as uh, we are modern cyber threat intelligence practitioners. 
So who is our main character? Well, this is detective turned spy master Alan Pinkerton. Um, and that might, name might be familiar to a lot of you um, because it is Alan Pinkerton as in the Pinkerton Detective Agency. He was the founder uh, of this organization. He was a very, very successful detective. Uh, so successful, in fact, that the co uh, company that he, is bu he built is still around today. Pinkertons uh, are still uh, 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 doing, conducting investigations. Um, one fun fact about him is he once smuggled Abraham Lincoln into Washington, D.C. to avoid a rumored assassination attempt even before he was sworn in as president. One fun fact I actually really like about Pinkerton is he hired uh, female detectives to work with him uh, at a time that was actually pretty unusual, um, but he did have uh, both female detectives and female operatives that worked for him collecting data and intelligence. What uh, matters to us in context of this talk is he worked as a Union Intelligence Chief from 1861 to 1862, largely under General George McClellan. And then finally, what's relevant for us in this conversation is he was not great at reporting intelligence. Uh, we're going to learn why here in, uh, throughout the talk. So Pinkerton collected a lot of information, right? So he had people uh, both operating in the Union as well as behind enemy lines. He was gathering intelligence, um, conducting counterintelligence operations. Every so often he tried to uh, put his, you know, get himself out there and try his own hand at on the ground intelligence gathering that didn't necessarily always go very well. Um, and he also operated a vast network of informants. So he was working with people who were officially spies on, uh, with the union, as well as uh, gathering a lot of human intelligence, um, working with informants and people uh, going undercover, uh, things like that. But his information was frequently poorly vetted. Oftentimes, it was based on single sources. And occasionally, it was received from biased narrators. He himself, as we'll learn in just a bit, also ultimately became a biased narrator in his own intelligence reporting. So sometimes uh, the information was ineffectively communicated, um, or sometimes it was outright falsified. So frankly, he had a lot of data problems. And shout out to everybody who replied to my tweet about how many Schitt's Creek gifts were appropriate for a keynote. Uh, <laughs> in the end, you'll see how many I actually used. Um, but yeah, so probably the best example of uh, his data collection and dissemination issues were uh, is in an 1861, uh, October 1861 report to the general, where he reported that the Confederate uh, Army, their number of soldiers, was twice what it actually was. He oftentimes inflated numbers, uh, in fact, knowingly oftentimes by the general. Uh, he padded a lot of the data. He didn't report um, the, what was truly coming in from some of his informants. He really wanted to make the uh, Confederate Army seem on paper a lot bigger than it was. Um, it was for a, variety of for a variety of reasons, but mostly it was because that's what General McClellan wanted. Their relationship was a very interesting one. Um, and this quote, I think, sums it up very well. Loyal to the point of sycophancy, Pinkerton never doubted the general's ability as a commander. Instead of serving his country or his president as a true intelligence officer, he made his friend happy. His friend, excuse me, in this case, is General McClellan. McClellan was very, very hesitant to take any decisive action uh, as the Union general in the early days of the Civil War. He had a very, very deep fear of failure. And so he wanted Pinkerton to be reporting him numbers that show that the Confederate Army was a lot bigger than it actually was to uh, be able to get General McClellan uh, more bodies, right? He wanted more soldiers. He wanted to continue sitting on his hands, not have to make a, de a decision because he didn't want to fail. He didn't want to lose. So um, in this relationship, Pinkerton really enabled that. So this is an example of something called hippo bias, uh, or highest paid person's opinion bias. Um, this is the idea that analysts will collect and disseminate information in a way that favors or appeals to existing beliefs in an organization. Um, this is very typically driven by leadership, or the hippos. So um, 
For example, if leadership believes that Russian APT are the most important and likely the most targeted to their organization, uh, defenders and analysts will be spending a lot of time and more key resources hunting for and defending against um, those threats. That, therefore, has the potential to miss or identify or disregard TTPs associated with other relevant but different activity. Um, something that actually comes to mind when I think about this is the APT versus cybercrime, right? So I kind of kicked off this talk talking about how CTI spends a lot of resources focusing on state actors, which of course are very important. Um, they are advanced, right? So they can be you know, very tricky, very important, and if your organization is targeted by them, very terrible. Um, but from a cybercrime perspective, right, there are a lot of cybercriminal actors. Oftentimes they are using the same TTPs, um, sometimes similar malware, um, but they have different goals and objectives. They often kind of fly under the radar, right? I mentioned kind of earlier on in the, uh, when I introduced myself that there has been an increase in people talking about uh, cybercrime and these sort of interesting um, targeted threats, especially when we're talking about initial access brokers that could potentially lead to ransomware. Um, but oftentimes they really fly under the radar. So sometimes leadership can kind of think about and focus on those APT actors um, and not necessarily give adequate resources or attention to some of these cybercrime adversaries that might be targeting them or, or um, actively in their network. Um, of course, Pinkerton demonstrated HIPAA bias, but it was also that he was kind of working in consort with McClellan, right? So there's this letter um, that was published in uh, the book Lincoln Spies that uh, uh, in which Pinkerton actually says, you know, per our conversation, as I intimated to you at the time, the numbers were inflated so as to account for anything that we missed, you know, they were padded. And uh, McClellan often went and took, uh, uh, took Pinkerton's intelligence, took his inflated numbers, and further inflated them in his own reports to Abraham Lincoln. So uh, it just wasn't very effective uh, dissemination of information and really appealed to the bias of the general. So what can we do to kind of push back against HIPAA bias? I really want to give a shout out to um, what feels like 100 years ago, uh, MITRE ATT&CK 2.0 in uh, Tony Gawande's keynote. She mentioned that the MITRE ATT&CK matrix can be a very powerful corrective um, to this idea of HIPAA bias. We can use the framework, we can use the, uh, the identified tactics and techniques to create mappings of MITRE ATT&CK to malware, malware families, and techniques observed in our own environments. Um, MITRE ATT&CK uh, has you know, this great feature where you can click on the threat actor directly, you can sort by malware, you can sort by TTPs. Um, so you can kind of use those to create um, visualizations or mappings that you can then use to craft search queries to help with threat hunting and detection efforts. For example, uh, mapping and searching on specific execution techniques, such as CertUtil or Bits Admin, uh, which are being used to download follow-on payloads. There are a couple of threat actors that have demonstrated that type of TTP, um, and you can kind of use this to hunt in your own environment. So what I did to kind of create a visual to sort of tell this story is I looked at Proofpoint's Emerging Threats data set specifically our Siracotta rules, and to see um, what MITRE ATT&CK tags uh, turned up most often in the detections that we are writing. Caveat, this is gonna look a lot different, right? So um, emerging threats is creating detections and rules for malware that's in the wild, um, things that are being discussed, uh, reports that are coming out, so new information we're constantly adding to our database. Uh, uh, currently, we have about 20% penetration on MITRE ATT&CK tags for the Emerging Threat Suricata rule set. And um, this is the average over seven days. And this average over seven days just happened to be captured when all of the wipers were coming out, the Isaac wiper, the Hermetic wiper, um, all of this uh, really interesting uh, malware associated with um, threats in Ukraine. So with all of those caveats, this beautiful, <laughs> this beautiful uh, graph shows that developed capabilities was the number one uh, <laughs> TTP that we actually observed, which is totally reasonable, right, given that we're looking at malware that is being developed by threat actors. Um, unfortunately for me and this talk, uh, developed capabilities doesn't have a defense mapped to it, right? There's no mitigation, really, to um, kind of push back against that. So if you're an actual defender, if you're somebody working in your own environment, your uh, graph is going to look a lot different, right? It's going to probably see the behaviors that are most uh, frequently observed, um, the malware that is you know, coming up most often, 
um, the capabilities or the defensive agent, et cetera. But I didn't think that this was a pretty cool way. Um, basically, I just used our Splunk instance to um, grab all the MITRE attack data and then push out this lovely little graphic. Um, the other two uh, the, of the top three would be exfiltration over C2 um, and data encrypted for impact. Again, that kind of aligns with the wipers that we were looking at. So um, this is really beneficial because you can use data, you can use MITRE attack data to build your case, to push back against the biases that might be exhibited by leadership. Some of these biases are very much rooted in what is the big thing going on? Like what is in the news? What are we hearing about? What is everybody talking about? Um, and that's obviously impacting our organization too. So we have to spend resources and cycles looking at it. Um, a really interesting example, I think, is um, again kind of referencing um, Russia Ukraine. There was a lot of concern over, uh, especially in the early days of the conflict, cyber attacks and the potential spillover, um, et cetera, and impact on Western organizations. There just wasn't a lot of evidence in the early days of the conflict that this was actually happening. However, there are a lot of people with ruffled feathers that says this is happening. Um, there is these wipers that are, you know, appearing in Ukraine. So we should be looking for them. They're probably impacting our organization as well. Well, you can take this data, you can take these mappings, you can say this is actually what we're seeing most often in our uh, organization, or you can use um, threat data that's observed in the threat landscape and say this is what's impacting uh, or other organizations within our, our similar verticals to really push back against that bias. Um, everyone loves pretty pictures, including me and including executives, so it really helps um, to be able to sort of visualize what's going on in your environment. Fundamentally, um, and ultimately, uh, Pinkerton really failed his boss. Instead of really pushing back against that HIPAA bias, instead of providing these sort of accurate numbers and data that his boss could then, um, I guess, further inflate, but they would be closer to the truth, um, he, he really just wanted to make him happy. And um, ultimately, that misreporting uh, likely caused uh, the Union Army successes early on in the Civil War. So another thing that I think is very funny and worth investigating is um, Pinkerton's sort of love of words, his wordiness, how he actually wrote and disseminated threat intelligence. I love this quote um, because I think it's very funny and very illuminating of not just Pinkerton, but kind of um, the expectations of, uh, of intelligence officers at the time. He always wrote intelligence reports in the form of a letter, and they began with a flowery opening officers of the day commonly used, such as, I have the honor to report. Um, imagine starting a tweet off like that. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so this was very wordy, very you know, flowery. It was like writing a letter. Um, as I was uh, uh, looking into this for the talk and, and uh, conducting some additional research, I stumbled across this quote from a George Mason University lecture uh, in which the lecturer described uh, Pinkerton's intelligence reporting as wordy and flatulent, which <laughs> um, of all the things that could possibly be said about my writing, that would probably be the worst. <laughs> um, so it's very interesting to kind of think about how he actually reports this data. So, Again, it wasn't just Pinkerton. His staff um, did the same thing, right? They wrote very, very long reports. A lot of the key details were hidden amongst flowery language, tens, sometimes hundreds of pages deep. Um, there was actually, at the time, two French brothers who were working with General McClellan and Alan Pinkerton who tried to become some of these sort of intelligence analysts to take and collect all of this information that's hundreds and hundreds of pages and try and distill it down further. Um, they weren't actually able to due to some of the issues with the intelligence itself, such as um, confidence issues, which we'll get to in just a second. Um, and they didn't actually have access to the raw data. So even they were looking at these reports trying to be like, okay, can I you know, actually effectively communicate this to our bosses as to what's going on? And they were like, oh, this is really difficult, I can't. Um, also, fun fact, he also reportedly doodled like big fingers on the edges, like in the margins of the paper, like, look at this, this is important, um, which is uh, very interesting. I don't think that would really work uh, these days. But succinctly and effectively communicating intelligence through written reports is difficult. It's not something that you automatically know how to do, right? Writing is definitely a skill, communication is definitely a skill that you can learn and hone and improve. But there are ways to do it effectively. 
and I'm gonna highlight some tips and tricks for your own reporting and intelligence analysis that you can take away today and apply tomorrow or whenever you're back at your desk. Uh, number one is bottom line upfront. Uh, this is called the bluff. This is a concept that's not unique to threat intelligence. Um, it's actually uh, something that's discussed in a lot of business writing and a lot of writing in general. But basically, you really want to immediately the de detail the findings of your reporting and why they matter to your stakeholders. You always want to put the most important information up first. You don't want it 20 pages down with cartoon fingers doodling that says, this is the important information. Um, because chances are they're not going to get to page 20 or 30 at this point. Uh, this can kind of be considered the so what portion of the report. Why does this matter? So what? Who cares? Uh, most people, especially key stakeholders like executive audiences, will not read every word of an in-depth intelligence report. In fact, a lot of your comrades and people on Twitter who are tweeting your story are not, or your intelligence reports are not reading every aspect of your intelligence report. Um, so think about what are people going to put in a tweet? That's the thing that matters. <laughs> um, but it really is, if you kind of think about it, you want to ensure when someone reads something fast, they can really understand the points that matter most. We have a limited amount of energy reserves in as, as people, right? Mental energy and physical energy. Reading things takes energy. Deciding to take action on something takes energy. And so by effectively writing and making sure that the most important information is, is, is detailed and understood very, very quickly, you can sort of save energy for your audiences and stakeholders to further make decisions like that. Especially during COVID, I don't know about you guys, but my energy level is like next to nothing. So I can read about a page before I'm like, all right. <laughs> um, and that kind of takes us to the next portion, which is be concise. Uh, I've said this before, and if anyone has watched my uh, like actual talk on writing intelligence reports <laughs> um, based on lessons learned as a journalist, you've probably heard me say this before, but I don't believe that people should require a thesaurus to read and understand intelligence reporting. That's not because you think your audience is stupid. Uh, in fact, there are um, sort of general rules that you learn as a journalist or that you might learn when you are a mass communicator that you really want to write to a fifth to eighth grade reading level. Again, it's not because people are not intelligent or the recipients of your information are stupid. It goes back to that idea that we have a limited capacity of attention. We have limited mental energy that we're going to be spending on things throughout our day. Reading and digesting and understanding threat intelligence reports takes mental energy. It takes more mental energy to read and understand one of those million dollar words than it does to read and understand a sentence or simple words or a handful of sentences or bullet points that kind of really break it down in the most easily digestible way. Also, that way, if it's very concise, if it's easily understood, if it's broadly understood, it can be more uh, effectively communicated moving on. Your stakeholders and executives can take that information, they can take, the, uh, take basically the key takeaways, and then further report it to people that they might be um, explaining something to. So the report should contain the relevant information such as what happens, why does this matter, and what can we and or what should we do about it? Sometimes the what can we or should we do about it piece is this doesn't impact our organization at all and we should not care about it. Uh, in fact, I think that that's uh, what a lot of people might spend their time doing, right? Like uh, if we're thinking, going back to talking about HIPAA bias, something happens in the news, something really, you know, something big and, and explosive and everyone's talking about it and it's like, oh my gosh, how does this impact us at all? It's like, well, it doesn't. <laughs> so TLDR, don't worry about it. Um, but you really want to make it very obvious what the sort of actions that need to be taken um, in response to this information and intelligence. Make it very, very clear to the, your stakeholders um, so they can make those decisions easier. Whoops. If I laser beam someone in the eye, I'm so sorry. I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> uh, and finally, and this is so important, you really want to consider your audience. So I bolded this because it's like, you know, near and dear to my heart and very important. But threat intelligence analysts should always be aware of who is reading your reports and why. 
that could be a lot of different people within an organization, right? That could be someone in the stock. Um, that could be someone who is doing IT security. It could be someone doing OT security. Um, it could be somebody in HR that is uh, writing job descriptions uh, for LinkedIn that are going to be publicly available information that contain sensitive details about your organization that could be potentially be used for open source information gathering by an adversary. So you really want to understand you know, who is your audience for the reports that you're writing and what actual decisions are being made um, based on it. Executives likely don't need eye to screenshots. Um, snapshots of code, uh, they will, eyes will glaze over and be like, OK, on to the next thing. Um, <laughs> security operations likely don't need geopolitical analysis of events occurring in places where the business does not operate. Um, that's not to say that you know uh, screenshots of, of malware, uh, of code, or um, geopolitical analysis of events going on in the world are not important. It is super important, right? It just it matters who is receiving the information. That SOC analyst doesn't need to know what's going on because they're not making decisions based off of that data. They're making the decisions about stuff that is impacting the networks, about the malware, about the behaviors um, that is actively going on in the environment, and not necessarily these outside events that have no impact on um, the location or uh, operation of the business. So you really want to make sure you know the answer to what decisions are being made based off this data. So actually, I have a kind of a funny story. So we published a, a pretty interesting report on some uh, Python malware the other day. It was a, called a Serpent Backdoor. And it was picked up in um, one uh, a, a political newsletter in Politico. And um, they highlighted the sort of the targeting, right? It was you know French entities and construction and government, et cetera. And, um, the gentleman, uh, the Python engineer, and the, the 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 gentleman who looked at the malware was like, they included the most boring part of the whole thing. Why didn't they include the like details about the malware and how it operates? I was like, well, the political newsletter readers are not really that interested in uh, the malware capabilities. It was definitely interesting, and to him, it was the most and actionable and impactful. Um, but again, to the people that are reading information, what matters most is really important. So gathering intelligence requirements and understanding how your audience is using intelligence throughout the organization can really help shape and improve your reporting. I said this um, to a lot of my team members when we are kind of trying to develop our intel program and um, our, our sort of intelligence requirements, is that you want to anticipate the questions that your customers or your stakeholders have. You want to be able to know what they're going to come to you with. You want to know what they're most concerned about. You want to know what types of decisions are being made, um, uh, the, uh, whether it's from a business perspective or a network defense perspective, um, and make sure that you are collecting and disseminating and reporting out that information. So when they come to you and say, do you have information on X? You can say, actually, yes, <laughs> we've proactively uh, collected and ass assessed this data. Here's a report on it that was either already published or that we have this information about. Um, so it's really important to kind of be anticipating the needs of your stakeholders, anticipating the decisions um, that are going to be made off of the data that you're providing so you can succinctly, effectively, and concisely communicate. So um, MITRE ATT&CK has really become the universal framework for threat actor TTPs and can be used to quickly distill and communicate threat intelligence. But where and how it's used really varies based on the audience receiving the information. Uh, I, as you know, many of you uh, are probably aware, I, feel, uh, I think it's really awesome that pretty much every intelligence report that is published by well, for, for example, governments will include MITRE attack mappings. Um, open source intelligence from, uh, from companies will include MITRE attack mappings. And I wanted to share an example recently of two reports that include the mappings of MITRE attack, but in different ways, because the audience and how they were communicating and receiving the information was a lot different. So um, Cyclops Blink Malware a small office home office router that uh, basically replaced VPN filter. Um, this malware was first published on in February of this year. Uh, it was uh, the NCSC as well as uh, multiple US intelligence agencies published some details about the Cyclops Blink malware. And I'm including the NCSC reports here as some fun examples because 
uh, I thought that it was the most striking um, and effectively uh, effective way to sort of show the difference in where and how MITRE ATT&CK is used. So there are two reports. One is a strategic report, one is tactical. Strategic is the blue and yellow, um, says new sandworm, uh, malware Cyclops Blink replaces VPN filter. You can see the summary is very high level strategic. It goes into sandworm, it goes into um, Russia APT activity, uh, sort of overview of the threat landscape, talks about VPN filter, talks about Cyclops Blink. Um, it's shorter, it's about, I wanna say it's about 10 pages. Um, and then on the right, I think, yes, right. <laughs> Uh, the right, you have the, um, the malware report, also published by NCSC. Um, this one has an executive summary that dives right into it, right? It starts off, it's a malicious Linux elf, elf executable compiled for the 32-bit power PC. Um, so their executive summary is very, very technical. It gets into the details. Both of these reports included MITRE TAC TTPs in, um, uh, in a spreadsheet, the, you know, the typical thing that you see. Which one do you think MITRE ATT&CK acted as a summary versus not? Feel free to point. Okay, I'm gonna pretend everyone is pointing. <laughs> to, yes, to the right. Yeah, to Cyclops Blink on the right, exactly. So MITRE ATT&CK was basically used here as the bluff. It was the bottom line up front. It was, here are the TTPs that are being observed by, um, that this, uh, observed by this malware, observed by this group, um, and uh, essentially, the, the so what was make sure you defend against these TTPs. Then it went really in depth into detail about how the malware actually works. It included those screenshots of malware code. It got very, very in the weeds um, and uh, kind of even about how the, the different architecture of, of the malware and how it might impact um, various uh, routers and um, other, uh, other things that it potentially compromises. On the right, or on the, the left, um, the, the strategic intelligence report, um, that had the MITRE ATT&CK mappings, but it was at the very, very end. So page three for the uh, malware analysis were the MITRE ATT&CK mappings or the bluff. Page like 10 at the very, very end of the strategic report, that's where the malware mappings occurred um, on that report because it was essentially a learn more. Learn and understand how this malware interacts with your environment. Learn the TTPs that we're out there looking for. Um, basically dig a little bit deeper. So in the same way, um, you have these two reports on exactly the same threat, reported and disseminated completely differently, using MITRE ATT&CK um, in a way that um, best applies to the stakeholders, the people that are reading it and making decisions off of it. So that was an example of open source intelligence, right? It was OSINT, it was provided by the NCSC, it was publicly available, had some TTPs, uh, MITRE ATT&CK data, defensive recommendations. Um, so this was information that we use as analysts um, to sort of inform and uh, uh, add context to our own reports. But Pinkerton, unfortunately, um, was not very good at evaluating information. Um, and uh, the information that he was collecting from open sources, but also from human sources, uh, was often flawed. So rarely did Pinkerton include in his reports an evaluation of a source's reliability beyond a general impression he had of it. This is what my gut says, um, which I mean sometimes is correct, but <laughs> not really effective for when you're communicating intelligence, right? So you really wanna uh, think about the um, high, medium, low confidence, right? High confidence, this is in my network, I see it, I know it 100% to be true. Medium confidence, this is likely true. Low confidence, this is possibly true, I don't have you know, high confidence that it is actually correct, it could be incorrect. Pinkerton did not have high, medium, low confidence, he didn't really have any assessment of his horse's uh, knowledge or reliability, he just put it in his 100 page reports, maybe he poked a finger at it that says look at this here, um, and moved on. But it is really important, our job as um, analysts and people that are you know, reporting information that we're getting to assess and validate uh, the open source intelligence that we're reading about and seeing um, on the internet, uh, uh, through Twitter, <laughs> um, through uh, vendors and governments that are sharing these intelligence reports. So typically, right, if we're working at an organization, we have hands-on first-party data, we're observing this either on our network, um, in our tool, so we know that it's true. 
we are collecting this information, we are doing research on it, we are uh, publishing data related to it. But oftentimes we are using open source intelligence analysis to add context, to better understand the threat landscape, to make assessments as to how the data that we're seeing might fit into the overall threat landscape or how the threat landscape is impacting how we're actually viewing this information and how we are um, going to be taking action on it to defend ourselves. Uh, a really interesting example, you know, keep bringing up Russia, Ukraine, obviously, for <laughs> that's the big stuff going on right now. Um, but in the early days of the Ukraine invasion, there was a lot of stuff going on online, like a lot of claims from anonymous uh, Twitter accounts, both anonymous as in no name attached to it, as well as anonymous, the hacking group that's not really affiliated with anyone or anything. But there was a lot of tweets that were like, I DDoS this government website. I stole all this data from this Russian organization. Here's all this. Uh, here's all this information that I stole and I'm releasing that's associated with, you know, the Russian uh, the Russian banks. There was just a lot of information that was kind of flying around. Um, BGP hijacking. I don't know if you guys remember that day, but there was like a ton of of claims of BGP hijacking that had occurred in Ukraine. Well, unfortunately, a lot of these claims wound up in. Um, in reports or, you know, had executives talking, had people asking, what is going on? Is this true? Are we seeing this in our information? What is this telling us about what's going on in the war in Ukraine? I wanted to highlight these two reports, one um, from MIT Technology Review and the other from the New York Times, both of them kind of discussing and talking about how um, things happening online, things being reported online um, were sometimes inaccurate, as well as how this sort of loose group, the Ukraine IT Army, was given directives to conduct cyber operations. Um, both of these were information that was being provided. It's out there. It's available in open sources. But validating it, confirming it, and kind of understanding what that means to the overall threat landscape can be very, very difficult. In many cases, the claims of hacking, DDoS, BGP hijacking, uh, were incorrect, right? Um, so people got like really spun up about things before things were able to be validated and reported as true or false. But there are multiple questions that analysts can ask ourselves when reviewing third-party data to support original research or to sort of better understand what's going on in the threat landscape and whether something is worth, um, is worth uh, digging into and could potentially impact your organization. So number one. What is the visibility of the individual or the organization? An example of this, um, an antivirus company might have most of its customers based in certain geographic regions. If they publish a report that highlights malware that's impacting um, specific verticals, uh, specific companies and organizations, that is going to be clouded or biased towards the geographies in which they operate. Uh, same thing with an individual making claims, for example, on Twitter. <laughs> um, what is the vi visibility of this individual? Are they talking about first party data collection? Do they have the information and they are making assessments based off of it? Or are they using um, their own sort of analysis? Are they making their own judgments? They don't actually have visibility into what's going on, um, but are kind of you know, making their own judgment calls and sharing information. So what is the visibility of this organization? Um, what evidence are their claims based on? It's really wonderful and amazing um, when uh, vendors or researchers publish all of the evidence that they were being that are used to make their decisions. It's great because that answers the next question: Is this evidence available to me? Can I take a look at this information? Can I conduct my own research and analysis based off of it? Um, if not, then you have to kind of ask yourself. Who is this organization, or what is the organization that is publishing this information? Do I believe, do I trust that they are uh, making high confidence assessments based on good evidence? Do I believe that the evidence that they have uh, leads to the conclusions that they're making? Uh, we talk about, keep talking about <laughs> the invasion of Ukraine, right? So I know there was a lot of criticism, for example, when the US government came out and said, we have high confidence that there are um, cyber activities that are happening, shields up. There wasn't any evidence, really, that was made available to support their claims. But there was a lot of discussion that says, well, this is the US government. They likely have evidence. Historically, you know, they have shown to be very trustworthy in what they're putting out, or vice versa, right? 
So it's really important to kind of think about, is this evidence available to me? Can I use it to um, uh, add context to my own reporting, to conduct, conduct hunting, conduct attribution, um, and potentially come to different conclusions than are what are published publicly? Does this overlap with known threat activity? Is this something that I'm tracking? Is this an actor that, um, that we see in our data and I'm using it to sort of contextualize or validate what I'm seeing is but what's based on um, public reporting? And we're going to talk in just a sec about how MITRE tax is very useful to that. And finally, qui bono? Who benefits and how? This is something I think that actually you have to kind of train your brain to think about. It's not really immediately obvious or, or kind of like a, a part uh, sometimes of the intelligence analysis process. We're very data focused people, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, so we like to look at the evidence. We like to look at the indicators of compromise. We like to look at the TTPs. We don't often think about the qui bono or who benefits. There are multiple reasons why an organization, a government, a person might publish information um, and data in an intelligence report. It could be economic, financial, governmental, geopolitical. Um, for example, a, um, a cybersecurity company might team up with a conservative think tank and in 2015 publish information about Iran hacking the United States, conducting tons of cyber attacks against um, the United States. Well, it might be interesting to note that that report was also published um, when the Iran nuclear talks were happening. Why might an organization uh, have a, you know, bias or um, would benefit by publishing details about alleged uh, Iranian cyber attacks against the United States while this major political event is happening? So it's just kind of something to think about, right? Like, if you kind of identify the benefits, you can also potentially identify the biases in the reporting. I want to be clear here. It's not to say that having biases or identifying um, the benefits to an organization or an individual um, means that the data is bad or that you can't use it. It just kind of helps to add context, context and understanding to the information. It's still totally usable. You might want to continue to use it and include it in your own reporting, but it is worth noting what those biases might be. So, MITRE ATT&CK is a very, very useful tool for validating open source information. Uh, it's great because I feel like uh, Adam and crew have done a lot of the hard work by collecting all of this open source information, going through the indicators of compromise and the TTPs, and adding them to this existing framework. It can be very useful to cross-reference stuff that you're looking at or stuff that is appearing in open source data with the MITRE ATT&CK framework. In many ways, MITRE ATT&CK has really become this dictionary of threats, this amazing resource uh, uh, of information. And I want to kind of take us back to another fun historical journey. In while Alan Pinkerton is operating uh, and fighting for the Union, while the Civil War is going on, there are a bunch of academics in the UK, in England and Scotland, that are like, hold on a second. We have to standardize the English language. There are a lot of dictionaries that exist at the time. They're just not really up to those standards. Um, they've colonized a lot of the world and are like, oh, well, maybe we should sort of standardize English um, in a way that sort of is for everyone. It was really a collaborative effort in the English-speaking world. These academics were like, hang on, what if we ask the people who are speaking this language to help us define it and create it and kind of standardize it? And really, the MITRE ATT&CK framework has become the universal dictionary of TTPs in the same way that the Oxford English Dictionary did um, in the late 1800s. Uh, in large part due to the contributions from analysts and researchers all around the world. I was talking to Adam when I was prepping for this talk, um, and according to the team, 155 people contributed to the framework in 2021. So congratulations. I'm sure a lot of people in this audience and watching online were a part of that. So, the authoritative nature of the framework has allowed analysts to verify open source reporting, better understand the nature and the behavior of threat actors, has allowed researchers to more effectively document and communicate those threat behaviors, as well as prioritize detections and improve defense. By standardizing how we identify and classify threat behaviors, actionable intelligence can be more easily communicated to a variety of stakeholders, 
whether that's in-depth malware analysis or very high-level strategic reporting, MITRE attack really has a place in the communication and dissemination of threat intelligence. Unfortunately for him, Pinkerton did not have a reliable threat intelligence framework or dictionary off which to operate. In fact, he really was creating and running the nation's first secret service that would eventually become capital S secret service that we know it today. But by examining the intelligence reporting failures documented by modern historians, uh, it, threat intelligence analysts operating in the world of cyber can be better prepared for when one day they too might be called on to potentially communicate and change the course of history. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for your time and hanging out with me, and I'll stick around the conference for any questions. Thank you.